In this video, we're going to discuss an overview of taxation in the United States with some comparison to other countries. My name is Kirby Cundiff. I'm a PhD, a chartered financial analyst, and a certified financial planner. And I'm currently chair of accounting and financial management for the University of Maryland University College. Taxation has existed largely since the beginning of governments, with the currently earliest known tax records dating to the city-state of Lagash in modern-day Iraq. Earlier taxation was primarily in the things like property taxes, which in the early U.S. were called quit rents, and resembled in many ways the payments a serf made of one-third of their production on their property to their lord. More modern-day types of taxation, like the income tax, require the government to be able to track income and are more likely when people can move from property to property. The first income tax was created by Great Britain in 1799 to help finance the Napoleonic War. Taxes are commonly created during wartime period to finance wars. Types of taxes in modern-day America include, of course, the income tax, which is administered at the federal, state, and in some cases the city level. For example, the cities of New York, Toledo, and Kansas City all have a local city tax. Some cities, like Chicago, have a head tax for hiring individual employees. Other um, large taxes include the payroll tax, which are required to pay along with the income tax to finance Social Security and Medicare. If you work for someone else, then this money is taken out of your paycheck and your employer also doubles whatever you put in coming out of their side. If you are a small business owner, then you have to pay this twice. For example, the sum of Social Security and Medicare is around 7.65% are twice that if you're a small business owner. Property taxes, again, have existed for much longer than the other forms of taxes, and they are currently also administered at the state, county, and city level. Consumption taxes are also at the federal, state, and city level. Commonly, the states have a state sales tax. In many cases, the counties have a tax on top of that, and the cities have a tax on that. The federal consumption tax, on the other hand, is more limited in scope. It generally doesn't cover everything that's sold, but is on particular items. The earliest uh, consumption taxes were on things like whiskey. Now they cover things like alcohol, um, strange things like uh, fishing rods and um, arrows, children's arrows. Uh, another form of taxation that was very common in the early part of the U.S. is the tariff. And uh, tariffs have existed since the beginning of the United States before the income tax. Initially, income taxes were considered unconstitutional, and arguments over tariffs were one of the reasons that South Carolina first um, threatened to secede from the Union. And then, of course, later the Civil War was based largely on slavery, but tariffs were also an issue. Tariffs have also been blamed somewhat for exacerbating the Great Depression. Other forms of government raising money include toll roads, fees. Um, it's common for many things to have fees that in other cases would be considered taxes, like you have a fee for your driver's license, etc. Income tax in the United States, again, it was initially considered unconstitutional. Uh, as is common during wars, uh, taxes are created to finance the war. Uh, the Civil War was partially financed under President Lincoln with the creation of a income tax, which the Supreme Court did later determine unconstitutional. This was also one of the first times that greenbacks or paper money were printed as opposed to a gold or silver standard causing inflation to finance the war. After the end of the Civil War, again, the Supreme Court declared this unconstitutional and the income tax was removed until 1913 when the final state, Wyoming, ratified the 16th Amendment and then created what at that point in time was a very small income tax. It was supposed to only be a tax on the rich and it was a 1% tax on net personal incomes above 3,000 with a 6% surcharge on incomes of more than 500,000. 
uh, with inflation, this would be 3,000 would translate into the multi-million dollars. So at this point in time, this was just a tax on the very rich. Um, that, of course, did not last very long with the advent of World War I. That tax was massively increased, as we will see on a future slide. The current income tax has multiple different brackets. Here we show brackets ranging from 10 to 39.6 for a single married filing jointly, head of household married filing separately. It's a progressive income tax. The more you make, the more of each dollar is taken by the government. Um, this basically came out of the Communist Manifesto ideas of for each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Many of the former communist countries like uh, Russia, uh, Vietnam, etc. currently have a flat income tax where the percent taken is the same by all payees. Over the life of the income tax, the number of brackets has increased and decreased. Um, significantly over time, and the length and complication of the income tax has, of course, massively increased since its near, um, initial creation. This graph shows the top and bottom brackets of the federal income tax. You can see that initially it maxed out at 6%, but that lasted only a very brief time period with the advent of World War I, that 6% was quickly increased to 80%. Uh, taxes were raised drastically on upper incomes. And of course, uh, more brackets were created. They were only raised slightly on lower incomes. And then after the end of World War I, one of the things that created the Roaring Twenties was this massive cut in taxes of the top bracket from close to 80% down to 25%. So again, people could keep a lot more of what they earned, which they invested and caused growth in the economy. And as we will see with all three of the major income tax cut periods, uh, this time period in the 20s under Treasury Secretary Mellon and President Coolidge, and then later on Kennedy and Reagan, each time you have a massive bracket cut it does actually increase government revenues, which is consistent with the Laffer curve. When you tax people at this high rate of close to 80%, the response of the rich is just not to work, so they don't tend to produce too much. So we had a massive tax cut, um, finance, or creating to some extent the Roaring Twenties. Uh, probably a lot of that was also created by the Federal Reserve printing a lot more money than they had backed by gold in a violation of the gold standard. So after the crash in 29, um, both Hoover and Roosevelt started increasing taxes back up to 91%. Um, Roosevelt wanted a 100% tax bracket, which would basically be um, a maximum income, sort of like you have a minimum wage, you would have a maximum wage, but the Congress wouldn't go along with that, so you only had 91% federal plus state. Um, this is one of the reasons, of course, it was so hard for the U.S. to come out of the Great Depression. Under these income situations, people really were not willing to work, and this massive increase in taxes obviously delayed growth and throughout the Great Depression, um, the unemployment rate was still reasonably high right before World War II. Uh, there were surveys of business owners that basically thought Roosevelt was Stalin, and they were afraid really to engage in any sort of business activity. This level of income taxes continued until the time period of John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy believed in what is now called supply-side economics, and he believed that if you cut the top marginal tax rate, then the people who are being taxed at 90-some percent would work, and many of them run businesses, they would be willing to hire people, and that would tend to grow the economy, which is exactly what happened. And then the same thing was done again under Ronald Reagan later on, where we had pretty significant tax cuts, resulting again in pretty significant economic growth. In each of these time periods with a bracket cut, 
you had a federal government revenue increase. Unfortunately, in many of these cases, the government spent more money than it gained in revenues, and therefore the revenue increase did not result in any decrease in budget deficits. Federal revenue by type, again, during the beginning of the United States, the main way for the federal government to raise revenues was through a tariff, which in some ways was a uniform tariff, in many ways was also a protective tariff of goods coming into the United States. And then they also had some excise taxes, again, on things like alcohol. Um, the federal government was much smaller than it is today, only absorbing around 10% of GDP, whereas today it absorbs uh, federal level 20% of GDP, state level another 20% of GDP, and regulates quite a bit of the rest. So overall governments control the majority of the economy today, whereas during this time period, uh, private businesses and freer markets tended to control most of the economy. Again, after the income tax was created, the amount of tax revenue generated as a percent of GDP massively increased from in this range at the federal level, two and a half, five percent, all the way up here at the federal level to in the range of 20 percent. And then plus, of course, the states again raised their own taxes. So now a large fraction of federal revenue comes from the income tax. They also get a lot from the payroll tax, Medicare and Medicaid, tariffs and excise taxes are now relatively small. Just like earned income, the federal government taxes dividends. They have changed the way they do this, again, on a pretty continuous basis every few years. Currently, these are the brackets on dividends. It again goes up to 39.6% for those with income over $450,000 but those in the lower income tax brackets do not pay a tax on dividends. This is one of the competitive disadvantages the U.S. has with many other countries, including European countries, because a lot of those countries do not have dividend taxes or capital gains taxes, so there is an incentive to invest money in those countries versus the United States. As we'll discuss later, one of the things the U.S. does is have um, tax agreements with these foreign countries, and that results uh, in an American investing in the stock market might have to pay a capital gain or a dividend tax, but a foreign citizen investing in the U.S. stock market might not have to pay any of those taxes. We can see here, again, the dividend tax rate was zero initially. It was jumped up drastically during the Great Depression, which again probably exacerbated the Great Depression, dropped around 1940, jumped up again in the 50s, and then has been decreased somewhat or quite a bit since then, and is now around 20% at this point in time. The maximum corporate tax rate has also increased drastically, and until the most recent corporate tax cuts, the U.S. had the highest corporate tax rates in the world, which created an incentive for many businesses to relocate their corporate headquarters outside of the United States. For example, Burger King is now a Canadian company. This shows an example how cutting tax rates can increase Ta uh, tax revenues are also cutting tax rates will affect the behavior of corporations. So here we have a dividend tax cut in 2003 where dividends before that were treated like ordinary income and you could potentially have to pay a 40% plus tax rate on your dividend income as soon as that rate was cut down to 15%, many corporations, Microsoft as an example, started paying dividends, others started paying higher dividends. And these, of course, would make stocks a better investment for elderly people and retirees. 
because they would have a income stream to live off of, whereas younger people typically just want capital gains. They want the, the value of the stock to go up. Beyond federal taxation, of course, we can look at state taxation. Uh, state income taxes vary significantly from location to location. Example, we have California at one of the highest rates here of 13.3%. And then we have quite a few states that have no state income tax. Um, Washington, Nevada, Wyoming, South Dakota, Texas, Florida, and New Hampshire, although New Hampshire does tax dividends, does not wage income. State. Only taxes, interest, and dividend income. So if you are in a position where you can telecommute, then obviously there is an incentive for you to move to places like Texas and Florida, maybe not Alaska, unless you really like cold. There's also an incentive for retirees to move to these locations, particularly the warm ones, Florida, Texas, Nevada, where they can get income out of their 401ks, 403bs, Social Security, et cetera, without having to pay nearly as much in taxes on it. The amount of taxes in sales also varies quite a bit from state to state. We have higher sales tax states. Uh, Louisiana here is number one at 10%. And then you have states like Oregon and Montana that do not have a sales tax. New Hampshire, again, has neither an income tax or a sales tax. The government gets revenue also from state-owned liquor stores, but it has one of the lowest, I guess, overall tax burdens in the United States. Gasoline taxes also vary significantly from state to state. Pennsylvania up here is over 75%. This is the state, or this is the total tax rate with the federal portion here and the state portion here. And then at the bottom of the list would be oil rich Alaska, which since it has its own oil is not inclined nearly as much to tax it. That would probably also include Oklahoma and to some extent Texas. Diesel taxes are a little bit better, are a little bit different than regular gas taxes going up to a dollar a gallon for Pennsylvania, which is again at the top. States also have corporate income taxes, or at least some of them do, which would be then added to the federal rates. It shows California here at close to 19%, which would be pretty much the top one, plus until recently the 35% federal rate could be a pretty good incentive for corporations to start moving out of California. This was a proposed rate. Texas, again, has no income tax on personal income and also no corporate income tax. Another variation from state to state is the cigarette tax, with Missouri being the lowest at 17 dollars a pack and New York being the highest at a dollar a pack. Since cigarettes can easily be moved from state to state, this in some ways is one of the tax rates that's a little bit more difficult for the states to enforce. The uh, police commonly patrol between Illinois and Indiana and between New York and New Jersey and other nearby states to try and cut down on people smuggling cigarettes from one state to another. And of course, there was the recent case in New York where the police accidentally strangled and killed an individual who was selling individual cigarettes without a state tax stamp. The overall tax burden, including property taxes, sales taxes, income taxes, etc., also varies drastically from state to state, with the top ones here in red, um, New Jersey being right near the top. One of the former governors made the statement that the government does not spend too much, the people are undertaxed, 
And then at the opposite end, you have places like Alaska, Texas, Nevada, Florida, etc. So the question would be, are the people in these states happy with this situation? And does higher or lower taxes result in economic growth? What we tend to find is they are not happy with this situation. There is a great tax migration. If we look at the 25 states with the highest tax burden, roughly 4.9 million people have left them during this 10-year period, and around that same amount of people have moved to the states with the lowest tax burden. In particular, the states with the largest out-migration have been New York, California, Illinois, etc., and the states with the largest in-migration have been, in particular, states without a state income tax, Texas and Florida. If we compare the United States with the other countries in the OECD, um, the U.S. is in the lower third in tax burden, but certainly not at the bottom. We are right below Japan. The countries with the lowest tax burden would be Chile, um, New Zealand, uh, Mexico, Switzerland, Israel, Korea, Ireland, etc. And those with the top tax burden would be Belgium, uh, Germany, Hungary, France. If you do a comparison with wages, average standard of living, those sort of things, countries like Switzerland do very well. Most of the European countries, including Germany, would fall in the poorest of the U.S. states down around the uh, wealth of, say, a Mississippi. Until recently, the U.S. again had the highest corporate tax rate in the world with 39.1%. Uh, that has been cut down into the 20s, and hopefully that will result in more corporations moving the corporate headquarters back to the United States, countries repatriating their foreign profits back to the United States. Um, at least it seems to have spurred recently run up in the U.S. stock market in that anticipation. Obviously, if you're the biggest taxer in the world, companies are not going to want to locate in your country. These arguments come sort of from the Laffer curve. The idea of the Laffer curve is if government taxes at a zero rate, then they don't raise any money. But if they tax at a 100% rate, like in the Soviet Union, they're not going to raise any money either. The only way of getting people to work would be through basically forced labor camps in the Soviet Union called gulags that were discussed in, for example, books like uh, Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So if government wants to look at its populace basically as a source of revenue and it wants to maximize the amount of wealth it can take out of them, it needs to find the so-called T-star on the Laffer curve where people are willing to work and the government can still take quite a bit of money from them. We will show that at least the top tax brackets approached before Reagan, before Kennedy, and before Coolidge were on the right side of the Laffer curve and cutting taxes during that time period tended to increase government revenue. The Laffer curve has also been applied to interesting situations like prisoner of war camps, where if the Red Cross or somebody sends in gift packages, the guards, of course, seize quite a bit of them, but they don't seize all of them because otherwise the Red Cross would stop sending them. So here is the example from the 1920s when initially the top tick, uh, income tax rate was up around 80%. Coolidge, the Secretary of the Treasury, 
Art Coolidge, the president, and Secretary of Treasury Mellon pushed for cutting these top tax rates, and you can see they were cut significantly from in the 80% range down to around the 25% range, and the top tax bracket being cut did increase drastically tax revenue because people in these brackets were then again willing to work, willing to start businesses, and willing to produce wealth. The same thing happened under the John F. Kennedy tax cuts, where when John F. Kennedy came in, the top marginal rate was 91%. He cut it down to around 70%. And again, federal tax revenue went up significantly since once again, people who saw no point in working when all of their wealth is taken by the government were willing to work when they even got 30 cents on the dollar. We can see this continuing all the way from the 60s until today, including the time period when Ronald Reagan cut taxes during the 80s. And once again, as the top marginal tax bracket is cut, federal revenues, federal receipts increase. So the Laffer curve works in all of these circumstances and at least 90 are 70 percent when Reagan came in, 90 percent when Kennedy came in are definitely on the right side of the Laffer curve, and cutting taxes resulted in more government revenue. As mentioned earlier, um, tax treaties between countries will commonly result in the citizens of the country investing in stocks paying a different and perhaps higher tax rate than the citizens of foreign countries investing in the same stock. This shows the condition of a lot of different countries investing in the U.S. For example, Americans earning interest on corporate debt will have to pay taxes on that debt, but German citizens will face a 0% tax rate on that debt as will citizens of Greece, Hungary, Iceland, etc. And the federal government does this to get citizens of foreign countries to invest in U.S. stocks and bonds. Um, other situations similar to this, um, when I was in graduate school, I had to pay income taxes on my stipend, whereas many of the foreign students did not. You also have an interesting situation where the U.S. is the only major country in the world that attempts to tax its citizens on income that they will um, earn while in foreign countries. So if an American is working in a country like Dubai, which doesn't have income taxes, he will still have to file taxes back with the United States. Um, there is around a $100,000 exclusion, but a German working in Dubai would not have to pay any taxes or file any tax forms on that same income. There is a list of locations where some of these graphs came up and also on further reading, the Cato Institute has a good discussion on the tax cuts in the 1920s. Um, this site has a large discussion on the history of dividend taxes the Heritage Foundation has a good history on also cutting taxes. The IRS itself has a history of taxation. And the Tax Foundation has a lot of good graphs comparing particularly taxes of different states. Also, this site has world taxation and the comparison of the different tax treaties. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I thank you for watching it.